Okay, so art has obvious use, right? Like, you can look at it, and it's neat. And if you're into the whole Jesus thing, for example, there's a lot of representative art. But, you know, what exactly does it represent? Jesus, obviously, cool dude. But the image of Jesus isn't really the whole point. Rather, it's the meaning of Jesus that matters, the set of values he's associated with and the sacrifices life stands for, but most importantly, your commitment. If you wear a cross, you're communicating that you are committed to that set of values. A connection to Jesus isn't just a personal thing, I mean, it is a personal thing, but it's also much, much more expansive than just you. It's a group commitment for all the Jesus stands. In similar fashion to how classes work, your group shares similar incentives or ideals or values or some core, notably unifying feature. Perhaps, again, a uniting commitment. Not something passive like a bunch of people with a particular hair color, but a type of feature that would define a group, a common, shared feature generally emotionally oriented. This doesn't just apply to Jesus, though. To get more modern, we'll pick a... Uh, Sonic. See, Sonic is an excellent way to answer a question some of you might be having. Okay, sure, representation and commitment makes sense, you say, but what does that have to do with art? Excellent question! Words suck! Okay, well, not quite. Words are pretty helpful, obviously, but in some ways, they're very limited. They need to be spoken or read and processed, and they require your head to take care of all the subtleties and imaginative part of representation. Art, on the other hand, thrives at those more ethereal aspects. You can get emotion from reading, but art more aptly conveys emotion directly. It's not that it's impossible to use something else, just that art is a really efficient and, insofar as human sensibilities, intuitive way to go. For example, could you express this in words? Maybe, but you wouldn't feel this in words. What's the point of that feeling, though? Well, it's representing something, although it might not be something to you in particular. It was made by somebody with a particular goal or mindset by one for one, and that's a common Western understanding of art, that it's individualist and as such serves individualist purposes. And here's where this topic takes a turn. That may not be very accurate. If you've had the misfortune of knowing who Margaret Thatcher is, you might remember her for the whole there is no such thing as society view, and while most people aren't quite that extreme, it's fairly traditional to describe groups of people as being defined as composed of individuals, not in the purely technical sense, cause like, yeah, a group is in fact multiple people, but in the functional sense that there isn't really such a thing as a group. Like if I count millions of individual pieces of tiny rocks on a mountain, that's just a lot of rocks. Or, it's gravel on a mountainside, and the fact that it has group as opposed to just individual characteristics changes what it functionally is. And that's pretty much what more modern analysis and intuitive inquiry trends to, suggesting that groups themselves, believe it or not, are a thing. Now, that might seem simple, but it's very consequential. If groups are things in and of themselves, they have characteristics and agency that exists solely in terms of the group and is not divisible amongst its members. If that's the case, then art doesn't just appeal to you or to you as a member of a group, but to the group itself. Consider, for example, a concert. It absolutely addresses a group, but the interpretation is completely individual. Speaking to a group, on the other hand, would address a group of, yeah, individuals, but with a common interpretation. A flag, for example, might induce the same state-educated sentiment across a population. You are an individual doing the interpretation, but your interpretation is defined by group correspondence. Art could be either. Sonic might address you, but chances he's not speaking to you, and if he is, probably not to you as a group. He does, however, certainly convey emotion. Here's where Professor Nguyen's claims come in. First, art is capable of functioning as a vessel for emotion-centric or emotionally-laden group attitudes. Second, there exists a category of art meant to fulfill this. And third, this category doesn't just exist, but does so in consequential and major fashion. Here, my educational children, also Dr. Scarborough, hi Dr. Scarborough, come the monuments. Before we delve, let us define. This is Danto, hi Danto, by Danto. Back when Danto was Danto, he made a point about monuments being functional art, as in, wait for it, 
it serves a function. Crazy, I know, but they do do things, right? Like, if I erect a giant-ass memorial, there's something it's memorializing. If I walk into town square and put up an ungodly-sized stick, that stick is probably gonna serve to indicate something, otherwise that's just weirdly complicated vandalism. More specifically, and for Danto, monuments serve to remember things, memorials serve to not forget them. Some monuments do this very explicitly. The professor refers to Gers, Gers, Gers' monument against fascism. While it is obviously related to the Holocaust, note that it's not a memorial of or directly referencing particular events, but a monument about general laid out conviction. It worked as such. Step 1. Place a large, solid, but unmarked pillar representing solidarity and anti-fascism. Step 2. People can mark the pillar with their names to show that they are anti-fascist. Step 3. As it fills up, the pillar gets buried deeper and deeper until it's entirely filled and becomes a plaque on the ground. The concept of commitment here is obvious, it's directly stated. The practice of commitment is also obvious, people signed on to reinforce and recognize the responsibility to be vigilant against the rise of fascism. And you, being an intelligent peer, might have noticed there's two directions here, as also noted by the professor. A, in an active way, monuments can be vessels for groups to express themselves, and B, in a passive way, monuments can be artistic acts that address a group. So the latter is obvious, right? The monument has a purpose, that purpose is directed at the population, bam. The former part is what might trip people up. How is a group really expressing themselves here? Like, yeah, they participated, and there's common group-defining solidarity, but it's still external. Aha, I tricked you for narrative purposes, it was not. See, an artist did put up that monument, but it didn't just spawn from the ether. Instead, they developed it alongside the population. Their proposal was voted on, refined, and yeah, that may seem minor, especially for something that should be so obviously universal as not liking fascism in Germany, but that act of engagement is what defines expression. Maybe, for example, you have a strong emotion you want to convey, but you can't draw. You can still commission it, define it, and participate such that it still expresses your, well, expression. That, of course, also means that you can address yourself, which sounds weird, so, uh, one sec. Okay, so for a visual, because you human beings like that, uh, here's shark, say hi, here's cup, don't say hi, cup is a tool. Now, shark could make art for shark, and cup could make art for cup, and shark could make art for cup, and cup could make art for shark. Will they? No, of course not. They're fucking inanimate. But it serves to show that the process can go in any direction. So that ability to self-address, by the way, is super, super consequential. If a thing can address any other thing, including itself, using means that allow them to codify otherwise difficult or impossible sentiments in an intuitively emotional and effective way, if I sound excited it's because it's really cool, then that becomes an extraordinarily powerful mechanism to allow the perpetuation and inheritance of, well, anything really, but most relevantly, value sets. It's kind of how a parent raises a kid not just by teaching them things, there's way too many and too many kinds of those, but by guiding how they get exposed to subtle and complex life. Or, you know, not guiding them, but... Yeah, ideally. That being said, a powerful tool isn't necessarily a good thing. The ability to teach something doesn't necessitate that you teach the right things, or even genuinely representative things. Let's say you hijack the process and institute stuff people don't really follow. You may get resistance, but things often just kind of blend in. For example, our own anthem and currency and federal appeal to religion didn't even exist until the 50s after being a delayed propaganda campaign due to it being considered unconstitutional. It hasn't even been a lifetime, and half the local political spectrum is based on it being a core part of the country. It really is a powerful tool. Similarly, just because engagement can be democratic doesn't mean it will functionally be. What really defines good use of that capacity is also the crux of this concept, group agency. It's the idea of those groups not only existing, but having their own distinct agency as opposed to just being an output for its members. People are naturally skeptical, because, you know, hyper-individualism is historically a pretty dominating view. Maybe, though, especially with the current tide of substance over tradition, you can accept that there are groups beyond just their component members, but you're not quite comfortable with the idea of groups effectively speaking to themselves. Maybe speaking is purely metaphorical. That, however, might be helped by breaking down how groups can differ from their components in practice. 
Consider, for example, a vote. This group has its own set of uniting interests or values and operates based on, well, voting. The body passes Resolution X, which is delivered by its spokesperson who happened to have voted against Resolution X. So what then? The resolution can't be attributed to a specific member, it's way bigger than just them and dependent on the group correspondence. It can't be attributed to the spokesperson, they didn't even vote for it. It can only be attributed to the group as its own entity with its own distinct path of reason. Resolution X might affect everybody, but it's not individuals affecting themselves, it's the group as a separate entity affecting them, even if they participate. Now, let's say Resolution X was the designation of a new representative art piece for the group. They've got two ways to go about that. First, they can make it, or second, they can adopt it. Making it is, well, you know, they make it, but there's an important detail here. For example, a film is technically made with the efforts of the entire crew, but only actors, cameramen, makeup artists, and direct roles made the film. It's not an expression of the caterers or the financiers. Adopting is also pretty simple, but just in case, let's say some person makes an art piece. Maybe it's about the group's commitment, maybe not. Regardless, the group sees it and identifies with it and decides to convey or express themselves through that art piece. Kind of how a country might adopt a flag design. All of this is the foundation for that first claim, that art can be used as a vessel for emotionally laden group attitudes. Pretty much any modern understanding of group agency is going to make that fairly intuitive. The second claim, though, that there actually exists a category of art that does that is a bit trickier to specifically define, but monuments are a pretty useful example. They undoubtedly enshrine commitments and values, although you still need standards as to what makes that expression that of a group and not just of a bunch of people, and the professor gives us three viewpoints. Okay, so first, coming to us from Bryce Hubner and Marcus et al., the idea of robustly held values as opposed to commonly held values. Say you and I both like tomatoes. That would be a commonly held value. It's just a thing that we happen to think in common. A robustly held value, on the other hand, has to be something that depends on us sharing it. If we're in a group project, then prioritizing a high grade or certain standards because it's from and dependent on our correspondence as a group would be a robustly held value. Second, Gilbert suggests that something's a group agent if it has a joint commitment, in which case, expression of a group would be anything that appeals to that joint commitment. The example used there is street art, where a smaller and perhaps hidden piece wouldn't address a group, but instead exists purely for its own sake, or because of its apparent rarity, feels special, and this appeals in a meta fashion to an individual. A large, towering piece of street art, though, would definitely be addressing a group, and if it's tied to what makes them a group, perhaps an anti-gentrification piece over the area of a displacing development, then it could be said that it expresses that group. Third, and finally, Pettit and Liss suggest that group agency is expressed by its distinctness, which brings about its own motivations and actions. Kind of how the IRS, assuming you either fulfill your duty or hide it really well, would consider you to be a good taxpayer. But that's only the view of the institution, which keeps record and functionally knows you. Any particular accountant probably doesn't care much or even know you at all. There does remain one big contest in that even if all of that clicks, you might still insist that because all perception still has to pass through individuals, that all expression is individual. But that doesn't really affect whether a group is expressing themselves or whether an expression is aimed at a group. Like, if there's an anti-murder law, it does apply to Greg as an individual, but no one would say it expresses just Greg or it appeals to just Greg. Fortunately though, murder being, you know, not cool, is easy to express on legal footing, but group expression through art is all about the emotion, the subtlety. Some people, like Glenn Pettigrove and Nigel Parson, argue that emotions, being necessarily fleeting things, have to be made explicit or formal in order to last. But there's a pretty big gulf in whether people actually experience emotions like that. University mission statements, for example, are full of extremely touching and important concepts of development and human worth, but nobody's gonna really feel that from a, well, mission statement is one might imagine. The university prepares professionally competent people who of integrity, who as lifelong learners and leaders serve as stewards, of a globally interdependent community.
The only real remaining concern is how groups could transmit their values and emotions across generations without having the benefit of being explicit. And while this is a very unfortunate example, certain nationalism is a pretty good explanation of that. Like, if you've ever heard certain groups talk about it, especially in the context of comparative supremacy to some other country, it often has to do with completely immaterial, non-specific, ethereal concepts of wrongdoing. They're often entirely incapable of expressing a coherent reason or cause for any of their sentiments, and yet, they've been grinding at it for generations, because even if it's complex, or subtle, or ethereal, it's associated with their commitment and their identity as a group. The good thing is that these values don't just have to be inherited, but they can also be created, and as such, undone. If you're gonna do that though, we have to tackle a mistaken traditional understanding of group agency known as summative theory, which, as it implies, associates group agency with whatever the majority of a group is. That might seem intuitive, but it's really lacking as explained by Gilbert because it can't help but associate obviously unattached individuals to group consensus in similar fashion to how, yes, the IRS may have certain group agency, but it's not the kind of engaged and emotionally laden agency such that it would actually describe any of its employees. It's the difference between it being a formal group and a substantive group. Most conveniently though, it means that us, as people who are very likely not involved with every possible group, can intake and understand their values and their commitments based on their own expression. It might seem like a really expansive journey, and hey, totally is, but think of all the hard to describe and ethereal aspects of your identity and your place in the world. You got those by chance. All the experience and commitment you have is a drop in the ocean of everything that's waiting for you to check it out. So there's never really a good reason to leave it be.